My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school role playing game podcast. And in this episode, it's time to flip Yola Tengo's 10th studio album on its head as we discuss Winter's Daughter. Our first segment is a basic crawl. Winter's Daughter is a 24 page fairy tale dungeon adventure for characters of first to third level, written and laid out by Gavin Norman part of his Dolmenwood OSR setting, and published by Necrotic Gnome. It's designed to be used with classic BX rules or similar old-school rule sets. The original concept for Winter's Daughter is by Nicholas Montegriffo, Frederick Munch, and Gavin Norman. The illustrations, both cover and interior, are by Mish Scott. Cartography is by Carl Sternberg. And so on to the contents we begin, as you would expect, with an introduction and the referee's background, which lays out the situation at hand in bullet points under the following headings, which sum it up uh, pretty well by themselves, so I will read them now. The Cold Prince, The Love of Mortal and Fairy, Forbidden Love Discovered, The Cold Prince Defeated, The Death of Sir Chide, and The Effects of the Ring. Now, The Effects of the Ring, uh, this is the key part, The Power of the Ring of Soul Binding is described as not thwarted by death. So Chide, the knight, the mortal knight spirit, is called back from the beyond to hang around in his tomb as a ghost. Meanwhile, the fairy princess is imprisoned in fairyland, and the tomb and her fairy prison are slowly drawn together, bringing the two worlds close enough to touch. And so even in death, the power of the ring allows the knight and the fairy princess to communicate, and they still yearn to be together again, and to join in marriage, and that, of course, is the situation into which your pieces will stumble. The history concludes with the sealing of the tomb and centuries that pass. So yes, basically, the ghost knight, fairy princess, want to be together. The nasty, cold prince, fairy noble, doesn't want that. And that's how the adventure begins, uh, with one of the then-provided adventure hooks. We get a bit of player's background and Dorman Wood setting lore. And then we begin with the above-ground approaching the burial mound, and a sacrifice at the Whiting Stones, a sort of sacrificial altar set up with some fairly nasty druid types. So inside the burial mound is the main dungeon of this adventure. It contains the Hall of Guardians, the blindfolded statue, the freezing mirror, the family crypt, the chapel of St. Sedge, the abandoned priest's quarters, statues with weapons, the Hall of Hounds, the Knight's Tomb, and the Warded Pool, which is the way to Fairyland. Next, we have the Fairy Prison, which is a tower on a frozen lake. It features the entrance hall, with some light comedy goblins in tow, the wedding feast, and the princess's bedchamber. The text concludes with an epilogue, as well as a section on magic items. So, Tom, how have you used Winter's Daughter? Right, so I have run it twice, uh, both times as a one-shot. One time was for a group of six adults using Holmes D&D, specifically the Blue Home Retro Clone. And uh, one time for a five-year-old boy using uh, Into the Odd, kind of, although we just call it the adventure game. (laughs) Nice. How about you? Uh, I have run it uh, in a one-shot using Trophy Gold. So, things we liked about Winter's Daughter. Let's get some basic stuff out of the way, I think. I actually really love the cover art. Yeah. And... I've been trying to think of like the best way to describe the cover art and why I like it. And this is what I've come up with. And I'll tell you, I mean this in the most affectionate way possible. But I don't know if you've ever like, if you have a memory of being in grade school, say, or whatever you call it in the UK, and you go to the library and you request a specific book of fairy tales or mythology or something like that. And the librarian comes back with a book that was definitely published and printed in the late 60s or early 70s. 60s, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that cover art, like that sort of like, that's what it is. <laughs> like it looks like it looks like cover art of a book that your school library has had around for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like it's that color palette, isn't it? And something about the flatness, it makes me think of <laughs> early Earth Sea editions, maybe that kind of thing. Yes, yeah? yes, yeah. it is very that as well. Yeah. So I actually really like it. It appeals to me for that reason. It just, it's so fabulously retro. Uh, that's a fairly surface level thing to enjoy about Winter's Daughter. I think the maps are dynamite. They are 
detailed but clean i know you had some notes about the maps too yeah i did they are, and that's the thing that they're very clean and that i think you don't need them in a sort of battle map sense there's there are very few situations in this module where you care that much about where people are standing but in terms of conveying the difference in scale i think it's very important and that's because the feel of the burial mound and then the open space of fairyland, I think it's very important that you have that sensation. And just being able to show people these nice, clean, uncluttered maps is very good for that. It saves you a lot of time and effort. And, uh, and they're just nice to look at as well. Yeah, I was actually playing with a person who had never played a role-playing game before. One of the things that I think is easy to take for granted when you're with a more experienced group is that people can kind of just imagine things in their head and don't really need to play aids like maps on the table. Um, I know most of the people I play with are were pretty good at that. I rarely even pull out a map. But I was struck by how important the map was to this person who was new to role-playing games. Like it really, really helped him orient his mind and like what we were doing he kept looking at it and referring to it in order to kind of understand what was happening in the scene and what things look like and this map is really good for that because it is clean but it's still like quite detailed it's easy to sort of parse as you just you know kind of glance at it it gives you all the information you need without being like overburdened with a bunch of psychedelic artwork or whatever so that was just something that stuck out to me that's not that's just a side note i guess but new role players really love maps (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I think that is something that is kind of carried through into the text in a way, this idea of things being clearly mapped out. So the organization of this, I think I'm just going to have to read an example, actually, of how the text is done. Because although I would say the maybe the intro, the background bits are a little bit, little bit long, uh, the typical description, it's all done in very short phrases using, uh, let's say, number seven, the freezing mirror. It just says, has a heading that says full length mirror. Then you have the bolded words, silver frame, and then unbolded in brackets, beautifully wrought engraved with crucifixes and unicorns at play. Then bold text again, hung from the wall, brackets behind the statue plinth. And then it has bullet points of what happens when you do various things or consider various questions, specifically going in front of the mirror, covering the mirror, what's its value, what happens if you take it out of the tomb, how do you unfreeze people? That's literally, I'm going to say, like a one-sixth of a, a page, one one paragraph, but it's concise you can quickly like literally at a glance read the key items silver frame hanging on the wall it's a mirror but then the detail parts i found i mean this is not the best example in terms of the prose because there's a lot of evocative word choice in these where something's got a two or three word description and yet it's uh, really on point and well executed and it's like that all the way through so i mean it's just kind of fantastic efficiency and uh, poetry the module is extremely easy to use at the table I was able to pick this thing up, spend about 30 minutes converting it to trophy gold before we started, and then use use it in conjunction with all the sort of normal trophy gold stuff very effectively. One of the things I like about it as a sort of kind of piggybacking on this idea of it being well organized, that first bit, the referee's background section, is so good. It's organized in this very neat manner. The info is presented in a way that's very thorough, but like you said, very succinct. They're not trying to impress you with the prose, which I really appreciate it because like in the moment when you're GMing a game, you don't really care about the beauty of the prose. You just want the basics. And (laughs) that little referee's background section, I think is a great example of that. Some other things that I liked, uh, the naming conventions here are perfection. Okay, so anybody who's followed my work in role-playing games or listen to me on other podcasts or whatever knows this one of my weird obsessions in gaming is that names of characters and things should be consistent with one another and this module really knocks it out of the park the human names are very englishy we'll say (laughs) lord brig for with brandy with the good the fairy names have this like consistent sing-song quality such as Uh, Butter for Bones, I think that's a troll or something, and then Princess Snowfall at Dusk. Writers of adventure modules, your text is elevated in a major way if the names of locations and people sound consistent with one another. What do you think about that, Tom? We we must have talked about naming before, but yeah, it's very important that you don't have... I mean, even more important than having good-sounding names like uh, Princess Snowfall at Dusk, which, by the way, is an absolute cracker as a fairy princess name. It really is, yeah. yeah. But like, if if the choice is between mediocre but consistent naming versus 
one spectacular name and a bunch of, uh, but they're all like in different directions, then go for the the former. Uh, the only exception maybe being if you're running Apocalypse World when any old kind of ludicrous name is part of the thing. But apart from that, yeah, you they need to feel like basically people who live in the same village should have names that sound like they belong to people who live in the same village. Even in a post-apocalyptic setting, like an apocalypse world, that jarring mismatch of names is a naming convention. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. It would be weird if you had someone whose name was Toyota Corolla and another character whose name was John Smith. Yeah. <laughs> like, that yeah. would be strange. Or maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. But it, it's more about like a consistent naming convention. Exactly. Even if within that naming convention, it doesn't make a lot of sense. So I really like that. I appreciated that about this module. I think the big thing here, the one thing I know we're both going to talk about a little bit, this module captures the feeling of a fairy tale very well. And here I mean a proper fairy tale, like one that some German might have made up to scare their children into being good, not like some Disney thing. (laughs) Um, It it just feels like a fairy tale. What do you think about that? I do. I mean, the the front cover says, I think, is a romantic fairy tale adventure. And it really delivers on the promise of both those things, and not in a very superficial way. We're going to talk more about that later, I think. But it's very easy to make an adventure that has the trappings of a fairy tale. Like, you know, oh, look, here are some novelty monsters. Oh, a dungeon that's a gingerbread house. What am I like? <laughs> this actually has, I mean, for example, romance is not just about having a ghost knight and a princess floating around somewhere in your module. Their actual connection and the princess's slightly evil plan to trick a lovelorn player character into freeing her so she can be with the guy she actually loves. That sort of thing, that's what a romance story is. And similarly, fairy tales are not just about having a troll under a bridge or, you know, a giant up a beanstalk. And this is, yeah, it's got a good fairy tale story in both the folktale sense and also the realm of the she Celtic folklore kind of feeling. Because those are two fairly separate things. But in this case, I think I would say it manages to do both of them reasonably well. Yeah, I think so. And like you said, we're going to cover this more in the Expert Delve, but I uh, I did want to note it here as something I really liked about this module. I mean, it just has that, you know, to me, like a good fairy tale actually feels kind of adult, or it's, or I should say it's not super clear whether it's for kids or for adults. Yeah. I think that this is something that is unfortunate about Disney's co-opting of fairy tales because it situates them firmly into the realm of like childhood entertainment. But I think like a good proper fairy tale actually has an older, more adult, more mature quality to it. I want to talk about one last thing, which is kind of piggybacking on what we just talked about, but the details in this module are really good. We'll obviously have some in the chain lightning round, but I want to call it a couple here. On the maiden statue, there's a blindfold on the statue. And if you pull the blindfold off, we're told that it's embroidered on the inside with tiny golden crucifixes. Like that is just such a perfect little detail that yeah. honestly, in another adventure that would go, the inside of the blindfold would, would be completely unremarked upon. But I really like that here. The statues of the footmen, we get like these details about all the weapons that they're holding, like a battle axe engraved with a horse's head, a warhammer with a head shaped like a boar, a halberg with a moldy pennant. Like just, just kind of, it lingers on like little details like that in a way that again, going back to the whole sort of like presentation of the module it's presented in an efficient way for the GM as opposed to like a sort of uh, verbose meandering. Yeah, like, like, but it would be possible to do that with some fancy description. But of course, that doesn't really exist in the realm of play at the table. Whereas what these details do is they make an imaginative hook that everyone can latch onto as soon as it exists, you know, as soon as it's described to them. And in fact, the blindfold, with the crosses inside the blindfold, the players at our table, the Blue Home game, for a brief period, just obsessed on that until I kind of had to step in and go, um, guys, just like to be on the level with you, this is not an important detail. Don't worry about it. Like, <laughs> they, were, yeah, they were suddenly theorizing or like, maybe let's bring it with us. We might need it later. That kind of thing. Oh, yeah, it's really good. Uh, did you have any other things you want to talk about? I do. I want to briefly talk about some of the other details, which is there's a very interesting thing here that I found came into play a lot, which is kind of a deliberate design for emergent play that creates like a changeable situation in the scenario in ways that the designer themselves can't predict. So what I mean here is there's the kind of goo that makes you float if you touch it Mm -hmm. that's in the dungeon. Uh, There's also a thing that makes you shrink. I had to look it up. It's one of the mushrooms in the magic mushrooms in the bag. 
And by the way, the player of our cleric, uh, fully committed to doing a squeaky six-inch high character voice for the rest of the session, which was <laughs> surprisingly not irritating. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. But now Kyle, who wrote uh, Blood in the Chocolate, has written about this in the past, because when we talked about that adventure, as you remember, I was not too like interested in the various candy ailments you could get in the dungeon, which would do things like... <laughs> right, what did yeah. they make you I do? They made you sort of yeah. stick to things or get massively big or whatever. But subsequent to that, and I don't think spurred by annoyance at my obliviousness of his purpose, but I ha- happen to see he wrote about that they're not just there for fun, although they are there to be fun. But what these mechanisms do is they transform the ways in which the players and their characters are able to interact with the shared imaginative space that you're in. If you're suddenly a giant, which is another thing those ma- mushrooms can do to you, your way forward and the way you can move around or affect things is completely different to when you were normal sized or when you were not floating or when you're six inches tall. So I can give you an example of what happened and I can almost guarantee that Gavin Norman did not predict this. One of our players challenged the ghost knight to a duel because he was the one who'd fallen in love with the princess, right? Now the ghost is immune to non-magical weapons. The player character definitely would have died but wasn't thinking straight. In order to stop the fight, one of his friends smeared the goo on him to make him float up to the ceiling and be unable to fight thus mm, you know yeah. like this is i mean this is it's the stuff of basically a lame gaming anecdote so i apologize for that but the point is that it sort of acts orthogonally to the way that the dungeon and everything's laid out like it just suddenly yes. gives you this other axis on which things can occur right and it's yeah it's really good it's also quite brave i think because when you create something like an adventure you sort of want to a little bit be telling a certain or setting up a certain situation a certain feel and by putting these randomish elements into it, you're giving up that control uh, over other people's games, which is, you know, trickier than you might think. Well, well imagine running it in Trophy Gold. Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah how did that go? Trophy Gold, practically every other die roll introduces the possibility of taking the story in some pretty wild directions. I had prepared the group for what kind of story we were doing pretty well. And so everyone sort of stayed within theme and tone with their various suggestions on the trophy gold risk rolls, but th- that definitely like sort of heightened that possibility. Right. <laughs> but it all held up pretty well. I mean, I was happy with how the, one of the nice things about running trophy gold is it sort of like walks the line between this very like collaborative, somewhat player driven experience and this more like module driven experience, right? You kind of get the best of both worlds. So you can kind of always pull the players back to the, uh, to the module pretty easily. The game supports that kind of play, but I just thought I'd throw that in there. You have a note here about it being a good reverse structure. Uh, I had yeah. a similar experience, but, but unpack that for us. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. So, uh, you know, normally the way we think about a classic dungeon, you know, set out from the town, travel through the wide open spaces of the wilderness, then go into a cramped space. And the deeper you go, the smaller things tend to get, obviously with mythic underworld exceptions. And then what happens here is that it does the kind of Alice in Wonderland thing where when you go down the rabbit hole, things suddenly get larger. A burial mound in particular, I think, is a very claustrophobic dungeon because our associations with them are being smothered in earth and kind of crawling through earth and tunnels of the dead. And so when you go down and down in this burial mound, suddenly you find yourself outside. And I think it's important that it's a frozen lake that it's in the middle of. So it's not just outdoors, but it's a completely empty and blank space so in other words you're you're going into what should be smaller and darker and you're emerging into something massive and bright and and that's pretty clearly i think a deliberate thematic choice yeah exactly i um, and i'll tell you that my experience at the table that came off really well like we had that feeling of like it expanding quite suddenly was very pronounced at the table and everyone really liked it it was fun it was a good time Well, let's go to questions that we had. Uh, I have a couple. They're pretty basic questions. I'm curious, which of the hooks did you use to get the players into the adventure? I used the one, the Tomb Robbers hook, just because that felt like the most appropriate thing for Trophy Gold. But uh, what what did you end up using? Well, for the one with my son, I guess I was going with Tomb Robbers because it was the, he decided he had to go and find a silver treasure, which uh, the search I promised to tell him where it was if he'd take this ring to his beloved. And then for the, uh, the larger group, I went with the, Uh, The one where the princess has been sending dreams to one poor, unfortunate, besotted fool who then drags the rest of the party along with him Mm. to go and find her. So, yeah, I did the the straightforward romantic one 
I think that's the hook I like the most out of the two or three it presents. My other question is, it wasn't clear to me whether the ghost of Sir Chide knows that he's tethered to the ring. What was your feeling on that? Like, did he did he know what was going on there? That's a good question. I played it like he did, but I wasn't sure. I think, no, see, I'm having to think back now. I think what I did was he knew that the ring was what made him able to speak to his beloved. But he didn't necessarily know that that was what had made him a ghost. Right. But to okay. be honest, that question was not asked. Nobody asked him that question. So um, I didn't really <laughs> right, have to have yeah. a concrete yeah. answer on that one. If he knows everything about how the ring works, he might be a slightly less likable character, which to the players maybe doesn't matter that much because they're not inside his head. But for me as the GM, I kind of wanted to like him. So I sort of, I think I wanted him to be a bit of a befuddled, overly heroic guy, you know? Yeah, no, for sure. No, for sure. All right, then let's go to the chain lightning round. I have a random event. A huge warty toad creeps over eyes the PCs quizzically, and utters a single croaking word, betrayal. In the family crypt are two floating skeletons, dancing arm in arm, a slow waltz in midair. They are slick with moisture, and they welcome strangers to join the dance. Another random event. 1d4 tipsy goblin merchants with lanterns climb cautiously out of a trapdoor in the forest floor. They have stepped into Dolmenwood from Fairy, seeking rare night fruits. Two gigantic stone hounds are chained to a doorway, which means they can't leave the room, and makes them not a TPK combat encounter, despite being immune to all kinds of harm, but rather a fun puzzle to solve in a sort of Perseus versus Medusa kind of way. At one point you encounter a mosaic that gives you some of the backstory. It says, It depicts Sir Chide atop a white charger, piercing the heart of a fairy knight with his sword. An inscription in Old Woldish reads, here lies the noble Sir Chide, slayer of frost, defender of the king. I just love that as a way of presenting the history of a place. We've talked about that in previous episodes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my last one. There is a hulking clay-like humanoid, the troll Grimmelgridge, ridden in a howder by the scrawny goblin Grim. It is, in short, the fantasy answer to Master Blaster. Let's go to the expert delve. It's the expert delve. Tom, what are we talking about today? We are talking about fairy tale elements in your adventure game. Okay, well, kick us off. All right, so I think if we are wanting to have a fairy tale style atmosphere in our games, let us quickly cast aside any discussion of trolls under bridges, fairies, witches in cottages, and so forth. Not because they are irrelevant, because they're not, but because they are, in a way, only the form of expressing certain elements that are more important to fairy tales okay so i buy that as a premise they are the witches and trolls and things are the sort of end point <laughs> the ultimate expression yeah. of the elements of fairy tales what's the real thing we're after here so the real thing we're after here and this will excite certain fans of the show yes indeed it will <laughs> i think the key element is liminality so uh, if we could just do a quick etymology sidebar, liminality comes from the Latin word limen, meaning threshold. In anthropology, liminality is the in-betweenness that occurs the midpoint, or the middle stage, rather, of a rite of passage. When you're no longer what you were before the rite began, so for example, if it's a sort of rite of adulthood, you're no longer a child, but you're not yet what you're going to be when the rite is over. You're not going to be an adult yet. This concept exists in a lot of cultures around the world, and there are real questions about what it means, you know, if you're trapped in that middle state forever, like if you're a rumspringer and you never come back, are you an adult yet or a child? No one's very clear on that. And so the relevance of this to fairy tales, which of course are stories that you tell to small children, perhaps, as uh, you mentioned, Jason, perhaps not really for them. Mm. Yeah. but more to be remembered later as that when that child gets older. Right. Um, or just by adults as well. And they are f heavily invested with situations of liminality. They're not, you know, you'll see a lot of analyses of various stories saying, oh, this thing represents that thing, X equals Y, but they're not merely didactic stories. They could be used that way, obviously. But, you know, what, what's the lesson of Red Riding Hood? It's not specifically do what your parents tell you, although you can make it that. But, you can see that within the story of Red Riding Hood, that path through the woods, I mean, come on, 
the path between home and grandma's two places of safety surrounded on all sides by dark woods the metaphor is fairly clear there and that's why most fairy tales are not about protagonists that are either children or adults they're always a young well a boy or a girl but they're not really a kid anymore and that's because this sort of liminal state which can be most often it's between childhood and adulthood but other kinds exist are perceived in let's say many most maybe all cultures as these sort of periods of spiritual danger yes and that's why the situations the liminal places or states that exist in the story that's why they also are dangerous or why they feel dangerous because they like that period of uncertainty in time are on certain places, in fact. I love this idea of what makes a fairy tale is the fact that they dwell in liminal spaces. This is great. It's really interesting, but I think even in our everyday lives, we sometimes find ourselves in liminal spaces, and those liminal spaces, they feel kind of magical in a way, or they feel scary. Or they feel, I don't know if I've ever experienced anything that I would call spiritual, but certainly there's like a sort of feeling of magic or terror in the air. Examples. (laughs) Um, I know this is something you and I've talked about in the past, maybe not on the show, but outside the show. I find the hallways in a hotel leading to your room to be utterly terrifying they are some of the most terrifying places like not in a way where i'm like quaking with fear but just in a sort of deeply unnerving way and it's because they are a liminal space they are connecting you from the lobby or like you know getting out of your car or whatever to this new place where you're going to live for a night it's this transition and you know, it doesn't help that they're frequently, like, very long. They usually have Stanley Kubrick, of course, yeah. keyed us into the idea of, like, strange patterns on the carpet. It, the idea that anybody could just step out into the hallway suddenly and change the whole dynamic of the space. They just have, like, an eeriness to them. And part of what makes them eerie, I think, is the fact that they're a liminal space. Or consider, if you've ever been on a long road trip and you stop at, like, a gas station that's really old and just not near anything. And it almost feels like it's in a different time period or just feels really, really like removed from your present moment. I think part of what makes it sort of a strange place is it's this waypoint in your journey from one place to another. You know, I think that's part of it. I think it really, really speaks to something that as a species we have kind of ingrained in us from the very beginning. What do you think about that? Yeah, the I mean, magic of everyday liminality. Definitely. I have this sort of odd fascination with these places like, yeah, like flight side airports or, yeah, motorway service stations, rest stops, especially the ones that I feel are kind of dislocated in space as well. Like what I mean by that is, you know, you can have a, say, a freeway rest stop that's in the middle of the desert and it just makes sense that there's no one around. But often you find them, I guess this is more common in Europe where populations are more densely packed. So like if you're at the, the motorway services, you could stand in the car park next to the McDonald's and look across like someone's garden fence. But the next junction to get off the road that you're on is like two miles down the road, okay? So to all intents and purposes, although you can see a few yards across to that person's house, in real practical terms, you're nowhere near them. Right, which yeah. Which I find is, is really... Yeah. Like, uh, and, and actually, that's the thing you can start to see in, if you think about fairy stories, like this idea of being able to magically see things that are far away but not touch them. Or to your point about hotels, coming back to our etymology, one of my companion adventures choices, the film, uh, mentions, I think, actually in the dialogue about how behind each door, as you cross the threshold, anything could be going on in there and you don't know. And and so the corridor is kind of an extended threshold. Precisely. Uh, until you get to your room. And that, again, is why Bluebeard's Bride. There's a lot of scary corridor business in that. And that's precisely because what's, <laughs> right, what's yeah. the other side of that threshold? So, yeah, I think if you want to start creating... And I think that's what we're advocating here, right, is creating liminal situations in your game. So you should try and think about those in-between places in real life and then figure out what's the fantasy equivalent. And for a hotel, I guess it is a big, scary corridor with a locked door at the end, right? Right, yeah, yeah. Guiding the conversation here back to, like, the sort of practical application and preparing for games, what do you think are some of the elements that you have to incorporate in your prep to make sure, or if you're writing a module, say, to make sure that you capture this particular quality of the fairy story? The two key elements, then, I would say, are, yeah, dislocation, I think, which is that 
sort of sense of not belonging to one particular place or state. So, like for example, if you have a cave that is next to the sea and it floods at high tide and then you can walk in it at low tide, I would say that's like an interestingly neither one or the other place. Or just, I mean, like the classic fairy tale location of the woods, which doesn't seem like a specific place, but it actually is because it's where woodcutters go. We know that because they save you from wolves. So in other words, it's the bit that's not in the village, but it's not the deep, dark forest. It's the place where you go to get stuff, but you don't linger. So you want to think about places like that that are, you know, if you're drawing the map, what's on the edge of the hex, and you want to incorporate those sort of places, which, of course, is terrible advice for map makers. (laughs) But uh, (laughs) is that a practical tip? I think it is. I think the real key here is to not skip over that bit. Mm. Okay, so like in Winter's Daughter, the liminal space is the tomb it, because you are coming from your sort of grave robber life or whatever. <laughs> You're going to the tomb and then the tomb leads you to the more like the, the fairy land. And the fairy land is so big and so expansive that it's very cool in play. But I think it's not exactly what we're talking about. I think the liminal space, the transitional space is the tomb itself. Yeah. And what makes that space so special in this module, it reorients you into like the history of the setting. That's the dislocation. The dislocation is I'm walking into the middle of a story that's been going on for a while, a drama that's been playing out for a while, and here I am in the middle of it, and it's all around me in this very confined space. There's also the alienation aspect, like you said. like, Like when you're playing Winter's Daughter, at the table, it very much does feel like the players are kind of separated from like what came before. They're in this space. Again, it kind of goes back to the sort of the tale of the, you know, the Frost Fairy and the princess and all that business. The way it sort of like just kind of wraps you up and sort of isolates you from like maybe your intentions of even entering it in the first place or where you came from. That comes across really well. And even though the players don't understand that it's a transitional space. They don't know that they're going to walk into fairyland at a certain point. It still has some of those features. It still sort of like presses upon them in a certain way. And I think that that's kind of the key. Like one of my companion adventures is a conversation that we had in another episode, uh, the Gardens of Yin episode, where we were talking about like what we were calling capital O, capital S, other spaces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I specifically talked about this like, transitional journey between our setting and the planet of Carcosa and I and how I dwelled on that transition I think that's the key you have to dwell on that part of it I think there's a temptation to sort of skip over the sense of being transitory of being in a liminal space and just getting to like you know whatever you're getting to you want to linger on it and you want to make the characters feel like you said isolated and dislocated yeah so you have some notes here about Gaming for kids for adults. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this was a sort of accidental so what's this discovery. About? Yeah, I think this is a quite, it's a fairly simple but practical tip, which is basically because I've been running stuff for my son, he's five years old, and I've been running things like the Thousand Thousand Islands modules, which are not child friendly. So I often have to kind of uh, talk around situations or kind of not present them with the assumptions that would normally be. Um, actually, Thousand Thousand Islands is a bad example because there's very rarely a sort of straight ahead you're expected to fight this situation right yeah yeah what i found is a good way to play your D D game with a fairy tale feeling is to proceed regardless of how old your group actually is as if you're the gm or fellow player of a small child of the appropriate age for the feel you're aiming for because like there's often this sort of semi-boast amongst osr people that oh well you know if you get into combat you've already failed uh, and like there is some value in that idea Although I feel it's a bit of a, an idle boast. And so like steering away from presenting violent solutions is a good way to promote not only that quite good way of playing games, but also the fairy tale feel. I mean, Jack the Giant Killer notwithstanding, mostly they don't kill their problems in fairy tales. They outwit them. They find a magic harp that can somehow help them. They think of something that's different. And similarly, fairy tales are sometimes gory or a bit grim. But, and this of course works best with adults because children won't even really notice when you get to the more chilling aspect of a scene you know like Baba Yaga's cottage has a fence with human skulls on it that kind of thing you just sort of mention it quite simply without too much emphasis like 
in Winter's Daughter, my son, I didn't really talk about how ghosts get to be ghosts, i.e. by dying horribly. And he didn't. He doesn't think about it. I just spend a bunch of time having them say stuff like, Woo, and who might you be, little boy? And then he says his name and he's looking for treasure and they go, okay, it's over there. Um, <laughs> by handling it with a relatively light touch, you leave open the option for the players to choose to dwell on the macabre aspects, right? So they can go and peer closely at the coffin and find out how they died, find out how they became a ghost. or And that kind of mirrors that moment in a fairy tale, a, the grimmer kind of fairy tale, where the, the hero pushes themselves deeper into the dark woods or looks in the witch's cottage. It's kind of a, a more honest horror because they've done it to themselves. You haven't just leapt at them with it. I agree 100%. Yeah. You may recall that uh, this is another one of my companion adventures. We talked about in the Tales of the Scarecrow episode, we talked about presenting horror at the table. And the way I present settings like this or moments like this is... I treat it like horror, essentially. I, I do it the same way, which is that I present it with a minimum of affectation. Very plainly, very simply, just say, here is this thing, here is that thing. And then you let the player's imaginations fill in the details. You let them respond as they wish. And like you said, they can choose to interact with it or not. I think that that is ultimately more powerful than than like overdoing it with the descriptions, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. or God forbid, like you start like, you know, trying to behave like the narrator of a fairy tale as you describe things or something horrible like that. Anything else you want to say about fairy tales and fairy tales at the table? No, not really. I, th- I think that's it. So yeah, in summary, I guess we're talking, yeah, in between places and states and pretend, <laughs> pretend you're playing or GMing with the appropriate audience age for the field you want. That's the summary, right? Yeah. Sure. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go to the next segment. It's the Companion Adventures. Okay, go ahead and just get out of the way, Tom. Okay, mandatory reference to Labyrinth with David Bowie and Jennifer Connolly. Moving on. Ooh, I got a bingo on my Fear of Black Dragon bingo card. Um... It's exciting. (laughs) We're joking a little bit, obviously, listeners. You know, I think there's a temptation for this particular companion adventures. There was a temptation to just do a bunch of fairy tale shows and movies and things. I did not do that. Neither did Tom. I think instead we're talking about liminality companion Mm. adventures. That's what it looks like based off the notes. We both have a lot of David Lynch stuff on here. (laughs) Uh, Why don't you start? (laughs) Okay, yeah, so, well, yeah, TV, 1990 to 91, it's Twin Peaks. Ah, the liminal spaces. So many liminal spaces. It really is. You know, there's the weird lodge that only exists in the dream realm, probably, and then there's, like, a biker bar on the edge of town, and there's the woods. I mean, there are so many spaces that are on the edge of other spaces in that show. Worth watching even just a handful of episodes, I think you would get the picture. Yeah, absolutely. I also went straight to David Lynch. That was where my mind went. I love his trio of movies that sort of explore Los Angeles, you know, and kind of feature Los Angeles as this grand (laughs) liminal space. Lost Highway, Inland Empire, Mulholland Drive. I like all three of them. I think that Mulholland Drive is the more accessible of the three. It's a little more accessible than Lost Highway, and it's a lot lot more accessible accessible than than Inland Empire. (laughs) Yeah, it's a lot more accessible than Inland Empire. <laughs> Marlon Drive, when it came out of the cinema, came with a set of questions that you were handed as you went in to help you make your way through it. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. you, I mean, you know, I mean, relatively speaking, let's yep. say, as far as accessibility goes, Inland Empire is a three hour mindfuck of Laura Dern going crazy um, like you know like it's it's more accessible than that so um but but okay so Mahon drive is what i'm picking and it's so great because kind of like twin peaks it kind of features all these it kind of deals with the idea of liminality in different ways like it has you know like i said i think the whole city of los angeles is presented as a sort of liminal space because we have the protagonist character sort of arriving and leaving one life and going to another but also there's these very like specific set pieces which the one scene in winky's drive-in which is probably one, yeah, yeah. it's the one terrifying of the terrifying things i've ever seen <laughs> scariest it's one of the scariest scenes ever put to film but it's it's a liminal space yeah, yeah the alleyways are maybe the most common urban you know they're not a street they're not in a 
Governor, right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But also, Club Silencio is like yeah. a, a sort of a sort of more uh, baroque liminal space. I just I just love this movie you're constantly like kind of moving in between like what is real what is dream i think it really captures that feeling of liminality yeah i've got another film for my final companion adventure which is dirty pretty things which came out in 2002 stars uh edge four and uh audrey Tutu. and this is i mean quite more uh, prosaically about liminal spaces it's uh about a, a taxi driver and a hotel worker and this yeah this was specifically about the idea of hotels as places that are hidden as discussed or sealed off behind many thresholds and specifically about and i got this direct from the director stephen frizz the people whose work and lives involve crossing those lines mm, yeah between like public spaces and the backstage mm-hmm. areas you know like being in the kitchen at a restaurant or being out the front or between wealth and service so yeah you hotel staff being particularly like an absolute nexus of that kind of person there's some agatha christie short story in fact where someone manages to to pull off a robbery or possibly a murder doesn't a crime because they are dressed as a (laughs) waiter because waiters dress the same as rich people but you don't think they're rich because they're holding a tray you know Uh, this kind of thing right and it's a good film it's like a kind it's not exactly a crime thriller but it's sort of it has Lynchian elements. It begins with finding a human heart in a bathroom um, while <laughs> right, cleaning the yeah. hotel room. So, you know, and then like exploring how that happened. So, um, yeah, very interesting film. I felt uh, enjoyable too, but certainly for this idea of existing, not permanently in an in-between place, but crossing the line between two different kinds of worlds all the time. Definitely worth a watch. Like I said earlier, I have a couple of podcast recommends. This podcast, in fact, uh, our Gardens of Yin episode where we discuss other spaces, I think is very relevant to the discussion we had today. Also, the Tales of the Scarecrow episode where we discuss presenting horror scenarios to players. I think that is also somewhat relevant to the discussion we had today, parts of it at least. The last thing I have here is, now this could be any number of things, to be honest. This is just one that I found. But It's a Route 66 road trip planning guide from a website called Independent Travel Cats. There's a million stuff, things like this on the internet. It doesn't have to be this one. But I really like Route 66 as a a liminal space that contains liminal spaces. (laughs) So it's a historic uh, stretch of highway from Chicago to Santa Monica that famously sort of features lots of like little roadside attractions and old motels and gas stations and art installations and things like that you actually can't drive it following signs anymore because it has been decommissioned for a long time but but if you sort of like plan a trip around it you can you can kind of hit all the things even if you're not like on route 66 right you can have a route 66 experience i've done a route 66 road trip and to me at least i found it to be very very enjoyable it just really, really hits a lot of like things that I love to experience in terms of, and it is because of the liminality. I just love this sort of feeling of going to weird roadside museums featuring, you know, Fiji mermaids and mummies and things, <laughs> or, you know, seeing Cadillac Ranch and things like that. Also, as I've talked about in other episodes, I've got this whole thing about like Satanists in the desert, which is kind of a thing that I'm, uh, yeah, in, yeah. I'm into <laughs> the idea of it the, my fantasy of like satanists living in the desert i just love being in the desert i love trips road trips like that so i guess that's a companion adventure i don't know just something i wanted to talk about i guess it is uh, although yeah this uh, podcast talk has reminded me uh, a podcast recommendation i would say is uh, fictoplasm which is a podcast about fiction and role-playing games presented m- mostly by uh, Ralph Lovegrove, and he talks about mm-hmm. liminal fantasy a, a lot. There's even a tag a lot. <laughs> on, on fictoplasm.net <laughs> right. of just liminal fantasy. I would recommend particularly the episode he did about, oh, what's it called? The Tremor of Forgery by Patricia Highsmith. Uh, not just because I suggested he do an episode about that, uh, but also any of the episodes where he talks about his game in development called Lag, which is about basically people working in what's pretty obviously Singapore and many time zones away from their home and feeling strange dislocation of that existence uh you should be able to find it by searching around on the website a bit to be honest dip into pretty much any episode and the word liminal will come up i reckon so <laughs> quite a bit of monster man too yeah not, not as much with, uh, with james as I think, much yeah, yeah. 
Well, listeners, that's our show. Fear of a Black Dragon is a production of The Gauntlet. You can find The Gauntlet on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. The website is gauntlet-rpg.com. We have a Patreon. If you'd like to support Fear of a Black Dragon, along with lots of other amazing things, go to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. Tom, thank you so much. Jason, thank you. And thank you to our exceptional editor, Rich Rogers. Thanks, listeners. Take care. Hi, listeners. We want to let you know that Brindlewood Bay is now available on Drive-Thru RPG. Brindlewood Bay is a role-playing game about a group of elderly women, members of the local Murder Mavens Mystery Book Club, who frequently find themselves investigating and solving real-life murder mysteries. They become increasingly aware that there are supernatural forces that connect the cases they are working on, and in particular, a cult dedicated to the dark, monstrous aspect of the goddess Persephone will come to vex them. Brindlewood Bay is a cozy crime drama mashed up with Lovecraftian horror. It's Murder, She Wrote meets The Shadow over Innsmouth, and we think you're going to love it. Your download from DriveThru includes the rulebook for Brindlewood Bay, including a version for easy booklet printing, play aids such as the character sheet and dark conspiracy sheet, and five mysteries, Dad Overboard, All Hollows Scream, The Great Brindlewood Bay Bake Off, Jingle Bell Shock, and A Murder Most Mucky. We'll be releasing 10 more mysteries over the next few months. Some of these mysteries will be featured in the Codex magazine, and others will be part of a standalone mystery collection coming out in late summer 2020. The first of the new mysteries, Exit Stage Death, will be out this month in Codex Yellow 2, available through the Gauntlet Patreon. So be sure to check out Brindlewood Bay on DriveThruRPG. We'll include a link in the show notes. Thanks.